This is a thorough introduction and overview of Matrix Transformations. There are chapters in the description so you can see what we're going to go over or skip around to the part you're interested in. Up to this point in our study of linear algebra, we've mostly viewed matrices as rectangular arrays of numbers, often representing the coefficient matrix of a linear system. But now we're going to take a more active view of what a matrix is, because a matrix can be viewed as a transformation that takes one vector as an input and then transforms it into another vector. This really isn't a whole lot different from what we've been doing so far. Consider this system of linear equations. The coefficients a11, a12, etc. are fixed, but the variables x1 through xn make up a vector from Rn. And this system of equations tells us how to take that vector from Rn, those n variables, x1 through xn, and transform them into a vector in Rm, consisting of these components w1 through wm. Each equation, of course, describes how to get a particular component, w1 or w2 or whichever it is, based on the input variables, x1 through xn. We can, of course, write this system in matrix form as well. Here's the input vector, x1 through xn. Here's the coefficient matrix. And here's the output vector, w1, w2, etc. through wm. This makes it clear how we can take a vector from our domain, rn, that's here, and then we just multiply it by a coefficient matrix, and that matrix has the effect of transforming this vector into this one, which exists in Rm, the m-dimensional space. Again, think of this vector as being the result of this coefficient matrix transforming this vector via matrix multiplication. We can make this sort of function idea even more clear with this equation, just rewriting this one in a more condensed form. W equals A times X. W is the vector that results when the vector X is multiplied by the matrix A. This equation really describes a function. We can make that clear by writing it with function notation. W equals T A of X. This is just like the familiar Y equals F of X. But in this case, our function is TA, a matrix transformation that works by multiplying the input vector by the matrix A. The function TA takes a vector X in Rn and it maps it into a vector W in Rm. And again, it does this by just multiplying X by that matrix A. Again, we call TA a matrix transformation or a matrix operator in the special case that N equals M. So the domain and codomain are the same. In that case, the transformation is just acting like an operation in that space. Here's a picture to help clarify things. We have a domain, Rn, and a codomain, Rm. They could be the same, but they could also be different. A matrix transformation, TA, takes a vector x from the domain Rn and transforms it into some other vector, W, in Rm. This vector W could also be denoted TA of x. It's the image of x under the transformation TA. TA is a function. It takes each input from the domain and maps it to exactly one output in the codomain. We can also write that like this. This says that TA is a function mapping the domain, Rn, into the codomain, Rm. This notation makes the domain and codomain clear, although that's not always necessary. It is useful, though. Another notation we can use is seen here. This arrow notation says that TA maps X into W. One more time, TA is a matrix transformation. It takes an input, and all it does to that input vector is multiply it by the matrix A. In this way, the matrix A can be viewed itself as a transformation. It transforms vector X into this other vector, W. Now that we've got an idea of what a matrix transformation is, let's see a simple example. Consider a matrix transformation from R4 to R3. 
this transformation can be described by these three equations. You can see that there are three equations because we need an equation to tell us how to find each component in the codomain R3. This matrix transformation takes us to R3, so it needs to tell us how to get each of those components in R3. On the other hand, there are four input variables, x1, x2, x3, and x4, because the domain is R4. When we rewrite this system of equations describing the transformation as a matrix equation in a way similar to what we've done many times throughout our work so far, it's clear that this transformation is really just multiplication by the coefficient matrix. For example, if we consider this input vector x, we could use these three equations to figure out what w1, w2, and w3 are, or we could just multiply this vector x by the standard matrix for the transformation, which is this, the coefficient matrix. TA of x, by definition, is the matrix A times x. And so that's this times this, and if we just carry out the matrix multiplication, we'll find that this is the image vector. This is the image of the vector x under this matrix transformation. It results from just multiplying the input x by what we call the standard matrix for the transformation. Here are some of the basic and important properties of matrix transformations. For every matrix A, the matrix transformation TA from Rn to Rm has the following properties for all vectors u and v and every scalar k. First, it will map the zero vector to the zero vector. This is just because a matrix times a zero matrix is a zero matrix. All of these properties just result from familiar properties of matrix multiplication, which shouldn't be surprising because a matrix transformation is just matrix multiplication. Property two is that TA of K times U equals K times TA of U. This is because you can bring a scalar out of a matrix. It says that if you transform a scaled vector, you should just get the scaled image of that vector. So you can scale it before or after the transformation and get the same result. This is called the homogeneity property. The next two properties are consequences of the distributivity of matrix multiplication over addition and subtraction. TA of U plus V equals TA of U plus TA of V, and similar for subtraction. So the image of a sum of vectors is the same as the sum of their images. This is called the additivity property. These two properties in particular, two and three, are very important. For one thing, these two properties together tell us that matrix transformations map linear combinations of vectors in Rn into the corresponding linear combination of vectors in Rm. That's because if we take a linear combination of vectors from the domain, say k1u1 plus k2u2, etc., and then we transform that, well, by properties 2 and 3, we can split the transformation across the sum, and then in each term, we can take out the scalar by the homogeneity property. So certainly, the image of a linear combination is just the corresponding linear combination of the images. That's a very nice property of matrix transformations. Certainly, not every transformation works this way. Not every transformation is a matrix transformation. Not every transformation can be so simply described as multiplication by a matrix. I mean, that's an awfully nice property for a transformation to have. So let's look at a couple of examples that don't have that property. So these are non-examples. They're not matrix transformations. Here are two non-matrix transformations. This first one is an operator in R2, and these are the two equations telling us how it works. We'll show that this isn't a matrix transformation, by showing that it doesn't satisfy the homogeneity property. We know that any matrix transformation has to satisfy the homogeneity property. So we're going to show that this one doesn't by showing that you don't get the same result if you use a scalar before a transformation and after. So let's see that. If we take the vector 1, 1 and plug that into this transformation, we're going to get the vector 2, 1. Now if we double that, so after the transform, if we double that, we would get 4, 2. 
But suppose we double it first. So we take 2 times 1, 1, which is just the vector 2, 2, and we plug that into the transformation. If we do that, then we're going to get 2 squared plus 2 squared, so 8, and 2 times 2, so 4. You can see that's not the same as what we would get if we scaled the image after the transformation. If we transform this vector first, like we saw, we got 2, 1. And if we scale it by a factor of 2, you get 4, 2, which is not the same as what happens if we scale it first and then transform it. Hence, this is not a matrix transformation. Another simple example is the transformation that just takes a vector and outputs its magnitude. You may recall this from the triangle inequality. Certainly, the magnitude of a sum of vectors is less than the sum of their magnitudes when those vectors aren't parallel. So this doesn't satisfy the additivity property. Hence, it's not a matrix transformation. The fact that not every transformation is a matrix transformation leads to two important questions. First, given a transformation, how can we determine if it's a matrix transformation or not? And secondly, if we have a matrix transformation, how do we go about finding the standard matrix that describes it, the matrix that is multiplied by a vector to carry out the transformation. The first question is immediately answered by this theorem. A transformation is a matrix transformation if and only if it satisfies the homogeneity property and the additivity property. So like I said before, these are indeed two very important properties. How do we know if a transformation is a matrix transformation? Well, if it satisfies these two properties, then it's a matrix transformation. This is also where it's worth mentioning linear transformations. These two properties are sometimes called linearity properties, and a transformation that has them is called a linear transformation. A linear transformation could have many different domains and codomains, but any linear transformation from Rn to Rm must be a matrix transformation by this theorem. So any transformation from Rn to Rm is a matrix transformation if and only if it's a linear transformation. When it comes to transforming Rn into Rm, matrix transforms and linear transforms are equivalent. Now, in the process of proving this theorem, which we do in a separate video, link in the description, we will have to find a way to construct a standard matrix for a given matrix transformation. And in doing so, we answer problem two figuring out how to find the standard matrix for a given matrix transformation. Let me show you though now how that process is done, and we'll do an example. It turns out that the standard matrix for matrix transformation depends completely on how that transformation acts on the standard basis vectors of the domain. So let's say E1 through EN are the standard basis vectors for RN, the domain, and suppose they are in column form then the standard matrix for a linear transformation from Rn to Rm is actually given by the matrix whose columns are the images of the standard basis vectors of the domain. So transform the standard basis vectors. Those are the columns of your standard matrix. So let's finish with a quick example of finding the standard matrix A for a given linear transformation. Let's use this one here. So this transformation takes a vector from R2 and maps it into this vector in R3. To find the standard matrix, we simply look at how this transformation acts on the standard basis vectors. The standard basis vectors in R2 are 1, 0, and 0, 1. So we plug these into the transformation. Plugging in 1, 0, we see that the transformation produces this vector, 3, 2, 0. Plugging in 0, 1, we see that the transformation produces this vector, 0, negative 1, 5. Then, to build the standard matrix of this transformation, we just take these images of the standard basis vectors from the domain, and those are the columns of our standard matrix A. So that would look just like this. 3, 2, 0 in the first column, 0, negative 1, 5 in the second column. So this transformation is actually just multiplication by this matrix. 
Notice a little shortcut here. These columns that we found by transforming the standard basis vectors, they're actually just the coefficients of the variables x1 and x2 in this equation. 3x1, 3. 2x1, 2. No x1s, 0. No x2s, 0. Negative x2, negative 1. 5x2s, 5. We'll have lots more to say about matrix transformations and linear transformations in this course, but for now, we'll leave it there. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and if you find my linear algebra videos helpful, please consider supporting what I do by joining as a channel member or pledging on Patreon to get access to early and exclusive videos, as well as the lecture notes featured in my videos. Thanks for watching. Uh, uh, I'm the mathematical menace, the machinations of mankind. Two calculators at the same time, hand signs and abacus, finger count and calculus. I'm the V to the T, my parameter, the rapidest. Happens like this, my lectures, the most prominent, dominant. Call me the Morgan, I get the compliments. The union in together like any time that we intersect, cause my opponents know they need.